So um, today we are going to talk about a new Alice adventure, and uh, this time she will be joined with the Mad Hatter, and uh, we'll try to resolve uh, the new problem, and uh, we'll try to figure out whether we need to predict or not to predict. Mariana? Uh, is the slides visible? Because uh, I, I don't see whether they're shared. Uh, it is not yet now. It is not yet visible now. I'm just going to share that maybe it's just got broken. Okay, so basically, as Roxolana said, it's going to be another adventure of Alice, uh, which is connected to the previous talks which uh, Roxolana gave uh, before. And this time, Alice won't be traveling alone. She will be with a Mad Hatter, and they will try to solve yet another riddle uh, with the power of predictions. I'm Mariana. I'm nice to meet you all. I'm data scientist at Restream. And uh, the main product of uh, Restream is a multi-streaming platform, and we are also hiring, so uh, quite actively, so we can uh, search for our careers uh, uh, later after the talk. And uh, also, I'm a data science lead at a local branch of uh, Women Who Code community. And in my free time, I speak at conferences and uh, also write short stories. I'm Roxelana. I work as a big data developer at Captify. Uh, Captify is the largest independent holder of user search data outside of Google. And uh, the engineering team is based in both Kyiv and London, and I'm in Kyiv. And we are also hiring in both locations and remotely as well. And I'm um, diversity inclusion ambassador there. Uh, also, I'm part of uh, Women Who Code Kyiv community as uh, data engineering lead, and I often speak at conferences mostly around Scala and uh, big data. So, as it was mentioned, I did a series of talks about Alice Adventures, um, totally different ones, and um, this time I'm co presenting it with uh, Marianne, and she will bring more of the machine learning perspective to my more kind of data engineering and backend side. And uh, before we are going to just dive into the story, I will make a short recap of the previous adventures or previous talks as well, just so we would understand better where Alice is right now in terms of the plot, because they're all connected, and uh, also the kind of knowledge she gathered during those adventures. So on her first adventure, she traveled to the uh, world of pods and high order functions or the world of uh, functional programming and Kubernetes. And uh, her first uh, place was uh, functional forest where she met the functors and the monads. And also she visited the default namespace city where she met the pods, uh, the deployments and learned how to create simple objects in Kubernetes. And in the process, she created this uh, magic database, uh, which was a custom object. And one of the instances was a pot. And also there was a storage volume of all of her knowledge about this world, which she decided to kind of steal and take with herself. So she wouldn't forget about this uh, adventure and this world. And the pot also tagged along with her. So then we skip to two years later, um, Alice became a successful Scala developer. She totally forgot about this trip. And uh, once when she was walking in the forest, just the same spot from which she got to that magical world, she found the cave and there was uh, the safe lock, which is in the form of the persistent volume. And uh, she remembered what happened before that, um, this amazing adventure. And also she met the pot, which was living all of this time in this uh, cave in the forest and was longing to get back home. So her new task was to combine her knowledge of Scala and Kubernetes and to build some custom object. In this case, it was a launcher rocket, which helped uh, to just move the pod from, there, from her world to his home. And she succeeded at that. And uh, three months uh, later, she became a big data engineer because she was just bored in her backend role. And one of her new tasks was to help the data science team to build um, the pipeline around machine learning model. 
uh, mostly on the servant side, but um, Alice decided to build a whole pipeline, kind of ML ops style. And uh, it was uh, an entity recognition model, and she built a pipeline, got the predictions, so it worked great. She learned how to use Kubeflow for that. And uh, one of the times when she was launching this uh, pipeline, she got this mysterious message that pods and high order functions are in danger. And uh, now Alice has a new task. Uh, she needs to figure out what happened to the pods and high order functions and how to get back to their world and help them to avoid this danger, or just to solve the problem that they have right now. So now five days passed uh, since Alice learned about this uh, new message. Alice found herself in a mysterious forest and she didn't know how she got there or what happened there. And then she suddenly heard someone calling her and uh, she couldn't understand whose voice was that, but it sounded so familiar and it was calling her name. And then uh, before she even had time to realize who was that, that the Mad Hatter appeared in front of her and uh, they were happy to see each other, uh, but they didn't have much time to reconnect, although they saw each other many, many years ago. And uh, Alice just uh, ran along with uh, the Mad Hatter to find out what kind of riddle he, he just got and he wants her help with. So they just uh, passed uh, through the forest and uh, found themselves on the meadow. And there was a caterpillar in front of them who was just waiting for them. But uh, Alice was not really amused because her previous encounters with the caterpillar were not really helpful in terms of her adventures. And uh, he usually was talking in some kind of riddles and uh, which was mostly kind of misleading instead of helping that's why she wasn't really happy about that, although the Mad Hatter was definitely uh, leading her to that place. So uh, the Caterpillar was not offended uh, with this kind of reaction from Alice. Uh, he, on the contrary, said that he was only going to entertain them with a riddle, and probably that was uh, her purpose in this world now. So it didn't explain much in terms of the world itself and how she got there but she decided just to listen and check it out. So somehow the caterpillar just guessed that it was exactly what she was feeling and just said mysteriously that soon it will all make sense. And um, Alice really hoped so as well. So the riddle was like that. What was lost can be found only in the anomalies of this world. And um, Alice started to wonder, um, what exactly was lost and whether it's connected to the message that she received lately about uh, the plots and high order functions being in danger. And uh, also she was wondering maybe it can give her some kind of hint in terms of the world itself and uh, understanding better the nature of this world and some kind of weirdness around that might help her find a way back home as well. So she just asked the Mad Hatter straight away whether he had any ideas on that. And somehow uh, the Mad Hatter was, even had pretty clear understanding of the riddle itself and the way they were going to solve it. And uh, that's why he just proclaimed that they need to find anomalies in the data. And Alice didn't really understand what he meant by anomalies. Since Alice didn't know what anomalies are, um, the Mad Hatter tried to explain to her in a simple, uh, in a simple way that basically anomaly is just some kind of a deviation from the standard. And depending on the problem we have, on the case we have, the standard can really uh, differ from one situation to another. Like for, he tried to explain uh, anomalies on, on fishes to Alice. And uh, sometimes we have like really many parameters which uh, I didn't which help us to identify whether it's anomaly or it's not. And for try for detecting anomalies, we can use uh, unsupervised learning machine learning algorithms. And uh, as you might remember, there is uh, two groups, well, actually a bit more, but here we will focus more on supervised and unsupervised learning. And if in a su supervised learning we already have a labeled data, uh, 
uh, like for example, here we have a cat and not a cat, then with uh, an unsupervised learning, uh, we may have data for multiple classes and uh, the model itself tries to identify how to differentiate them and uh, whether it's possible by the features and parameters that we have. So basically, uh, we can use unsupervised learning algorithm for our anomaly detection problem. And uh, in our case, it can be k-means, which is a clustering algorithm. And uh, it basically works in such a way that we uh, identify the number of clusters that our data should be divided into. And we can do it through experiments in order to find the best division of data into clusters. And uh, then uh, we basically have uh, the coordinates of, of the centroids, the center points of clusters. And we try to find how close our data points to each of the centers in order to identify whether this point belongs to one cluster or another. So for Alice, it sounded quite familiar and uh, it reminded her of, of the previous work that she did for the data science team. So she figured that um, the Matt Hatter was talking about machine learning models. And uh, he approved that because he was talking about machine learning models and specifically anomaly detection models. And for Alice, it was familiar more on the side of um, kind of abstracting away from the model itself. So remembering what she learned uh, during her work with the data science team was that there is this whole kind of pipeline around building the model and uh, actually building machine learning model is only one of the steps of this pipeline, which has uh, an iterative nature. So there are these multiple stages uh, also in a very kind of generalized view, they can be interchanged and uh, just flexibly change with one another depending on the task. So there is data ingestion, it can be batch or streaming data, doesn't really matter, any kind of framework to use for that. Uh, the next step would be data analysis. We need to understand um, the types of data that we have, uh, the data sets in general, we can have um, two different streams of data, for example, streaming and batch data, or we can have uh, two different uh, formats of the data. Therefore, we need to explore all the types that we have, uh, understand it from the business point of view, and uh, also to figure out the values themselves. Like for example, there can be some zero values uh, which will point out to some records that might need to be deleted in the future. And after that, we are able to build some transformations on top of this data. It can be cleaning some kind of pre-processing of the data, like removing the records, uh, changing the data types if it's needed which often happens uh, with the values of uh, timestamp format. And um, also in the same stage, we are able to build some features like for the future of building the machine learning model. And after that, we can start building the model, training it. Um, as soon as we build the model itself, we are evaluated, validate the results, and we can get to the serving of the model. But again, it's, uh, the process itself is quite flexible because uh, when we are working on the model, for example, we can figure out that actually we need to build more features and we can get back to the previous step. Or we can figure out that we need to um, analyze the data better and add more features or add one more source of data. So basically we can get back to one, two or three steps before. And it's totally normal to actually repeat the cycle as well and uh, to rebuild the model or enhance it in some way. So if we abstract away again from the model itself, um, the algorithm within the model, um, the solution to this problem would look like this. We have some source data given by the caterpillar, some kind of numbers and ranges, and uh, we need to build the machine learning model we abstract away again from the fact that we are pre-processing the data, transforming it. We're just going to put it into this one stage of building the model. And the result of it will be detected anomalies in any format that you wanted to see. So the math header asked, um, how exactly are they going to solve it together considering that they had different perspectives and different experiences? And um, Alice was thinking of the way she collaborated with the data science team. And uh, what she figured in the process is that 
it's okay for um, data engineers to take some part of the work and um, collaborate with the data scientists uh, on their part of the work. So in this um, pipeline image, again, we can see that there are some green squares for the data engineer work. For example, data engineers would mostly work on ingesting the data, uh, building some transformations like clean up, pre-processing, and actually serving the model, which is more on the infrastructure side of things. While data scientists would work on analyzing the data, which would help them to build the features, as you can see, data transformation is kind of divided between the two. So they are building the features usually, uh, and then building the model itself and uh, evaluate it. In this case, um, as I said, the data engineers communicate with data scientists without getting into the algorithm itself, kind of viewing it as a black box. While data scientists uh, get some pre-processed data that they need, and uh, also they perform some work on the model, return it, and don't really care whether it's uh, served in some way, which is more, again, on the infrastructural side of things. Obviously, it can work differently, but in this case, it was a perfect solution to combine their perspectives. And um, also, Alice proposed to solve it in Scala, and not only in Scala, specifically using Spark, um, because um, Spark helps um, for people with Python background to kind of move easier into uh, building a model and combining both data engineering and data science work. And at the same time, Spark sometimes is kind of similar to the way we are writing in Python, just the same as in Scala. So therefore, it's kind of easier to transition to another language. So um, Alice decided to take uh, first the part with ingestion of the data, and um, she decided to work on the RGDs just to explore how it works on the lower level. So she just took uh, the file that was given uh, by the Caterpillar, removed some unnecessary values, and uh, as a result got uh, the vector, which is um, basically an array of floating point numbers and the labels of this uh, array or columns. And um, also she cached some data for better performance of the Spark application itself. And the next step, step would be to normalize the data. Um, and uh, Alice didn't really know what normalization meant, uh, although the math had very confidently suggested that they should do that right before training a model and getting predictions. And uh, he decided to explain it that basically normalization is a way to make the model more accurate. And by that, uh, he meant that uh, different data ranges of different features uh, wouldn't influence uh, the results. If you, if you try to smooth down the data, and for example, here we can do it through standard deviations and mean values, but also there, are, there is a lot of uh, other ways to do that. And uh, there is no like one specific just right a way to do that, but basically you normalize the data, not just for uh, anomaly detection problems, but in general uh, to avoid the model from, to prevent the model from focusing on the magnitudes of uh, the features instead of their actual contribution. And uh, for clustering specifically, um, normalization is also important uh, because uh, Kamins tends to predict rounded clusters and uh, predicting uh, the values which have like different magnitudes might, might be confusing and we might get not accurate results. So basically that's how the first part of the solution was done. And um, they started to wonder what, what can be done next. And Alice suggested to work more on the pipeline itself. So basically uh, in the pipeline for anomaly detection, uh, Spark context is initialized as an entry point and then uh, the data is loaded, which is already normalized because uh, Alice worked on uh, data ingestion and pre-processing before model training and model then trained, uh, is trained on normalized data. And we also need to set the values of, uh, of the centers of our clusters. And since uh, we are doing anomaly detection here, we can just uh, predict one cluster and any point which uh, deviates from this one cluster is considered to be an anomaly. And uh, it's a standard way of working with commins by 
defining that uh, the center will be in zero, but it can be moved anywhere you want to, and you can like change that uh, over time. Also, distances uh, are calculated uh, for our data points, as the Matt Hatter already described a bit earlier. Uh, that basically every point is evaluated for its distance to the centroid. And since we have just one cluster, we uh, compare our data points to just one centroid. And also we have a threshold and the threshold is used basically because uh, we can identify how far the point can, can be, can be located uh, away from the cluster's center. And it also helps us to see what's the anomaly in there. So now they needed to actually train a model after working on a pipeline. And model training is uh, basically about initialization of commins. And we already have our data pre-processed as vectors. And we set number of clusters, which is uh, necessary for commins algorithm. And then we rerun uh, our uh, model several times. Why would why would we do this that? Because um, basically commins is very sensitive to the order of objects. That's why it's better to randomize that and to rerun the model several times. And then we just uh, get our predictions and uh, we can work on the next part of the, of the pipeline. So let's dive a bit deeper also into the function, which is about calculation of distances uh, to the centroid. It's, it's basically the key function which helps us to implement the essence of commins. And it's about uh, actually finding this distance which uh, will help us to see whether the point is an anomaly or it actually belongs to our uh, cluster of, the, of all other data points. Um, so the Matt Heather asked how they are going to run this job since it's a Spark application and uh, it can be executed in multiple ways. And um, Alice uh, confidently suppo supposed that they should use uh, Kubernetes. And uh, actually the Matt Hatter was not really sure about this idea since um, the scale was kind of small to use Kubernetes. So it seemed like a bit over complication of the task. But Alice considered that Kubernetes is always a good idea, so why not explore it in this environment as well? So just before we are going to see the actual implementation, a bit of the background uh, behind the Spark application working on Kubernetes, uh, specifically with uh, native support of Kubernetes. So uh, the client uh, kind of submits, the Spark submits script that is written by the developer. And it works in such a way that um, this script uh, kind of uh, is a sent as a request to the Kubernetes API server. And same as the this simple Kubernetes objects, um, API server consider that um, we need to create this kind of objects described in this script. And uh, it will be like Spark application. And uh, therefore API server authorizes this request. Uh, finds the proper credentials and um, then working tightly with the scheduler actually schedules the Spark driver. And the uh, Spark driver is usually is kind of in the form of the pod. So as soon as the driver is scheduled, we can also see in the logs that the driver asks for more resources for the executors and uh, they get scheduled in their turn. So basically that's how Spark application would run with uh, native support by Kubernetes. And um, Spark submit script for this application would look like this. So first of all, the main parameters that we always use when we are running Spark submit, it's master. So in this case, it's going to be the link uh, to the master of the Kubernetes cluster with the host and port kind of immediate here for security reasons. Um, another configuration is uh, deploy mode. In this case, it's going to be a small cluster, therefore it's cluster mode. And most of the times it is cluster mode. Quite rarely we use some standalone local modes. Um, another configuration is the naming. In this case, it doesn't really matter. Just it's easier to distinguish uh, by the name when we have multiple Spark applications running in the system. So let it be anomaly detection. 
Um, another configuration is a class, which is the name of the main class that we used for the whole pipeline, where we have the main method containing, because it allows Spark to figure out how exactly it's going to run the application, kind of pointing out that here's the Spark context uh, where we initialized it, and here's the main method that's going to kick in. And uh, two more configurations are specific for running Spark on Kubernetes. So we have service account name, um, which is the name of the service account we set up in the cluster. It allows to authenticate the Spark application within Kubernetes. Uh, without it, it's not going to schedule any Spark applications. And uh, one more configuration is the container image. In this case, it's going to be Spark image to understand what kind of containers we are going to run, Spark containers, and the version the latest. So, in the end, we need to point out to the actual application we are going to run in the jar file format. So it's packaged applications that we've built with some name, anomaly detection, the version of Spark, and uh, pointing to the local file system where it's held on the cluster. So the result they got looked like this. It's just a bunch of uh, zeros and ones. Ellis said that uh, they are just random numbers, but uh, the caterpillar disagreed with her, and he uh, said that uh, they are not random at all. And he tried to give uh, her and uh, the mad hatter a little hint that these numbers are not the ordinary numbers, but they are binary. And it made Alice wondering what she can take out of that information. And uh, as she started to think more about that, she realized she got an idea, and she said. I think I know how to. And then Alice woke up uh, on the chair in front of her TV. Um, she realized that she fell asleep on the Halloween night watching some horror movies. And um, also she figured that she had some really vivid dream about traveling with the Mad Hatter and some caterpillar riddles, machine learning, which was a very weird mix of things. But also she remembered that actually there was some kind of riddle in the end of this uh, dream that she was trying to solve and that she figured somehow how to do that. So Alice tried to kind of step back and uh, figure what her thoughts were at the time. And uh, she remembered that they were talking about different presentations of the same information. And the caterpillar said something about a binary presentation. And that's when she realized that uh, actually her idea was to present the same information in some different format, which is basically more readable. But she also didn't really remember the actual result, like the bunch of zeros and ones. She couldn't just memorize that. And uh, at that point, Alice realized that she was holding some kind of piece of paper when she woke up. So Alice looked at it and um, so that there was this message written on it that the past is the key to the future. And that's when Alice realized that actually she needs to look for some kind of solution uh, to the danger that happened to the pods and higher order functions in the past of their world. And somehow it's going to point out to the solution of this problem, to the problem itself, and will help her to save them. So the story is uh, to be continued. And uh, thank you for attention. Yes, thanks for your attention. Also, happy Halloween to you. And uh, we, you can follow both of us on Twitter. You can find uh, our pre previous talks at Speaker Deck, and we will uh, share these slides there as well. And also, you can find uh, the slides from the previous Alice uh, journeys uh, that Roxalana presented before uh, at her Speaker Deck as well. Yeah, thank you. And we'll be waiting for your questions around that. Thank you. Okay.